Uh, Henry II uh, ruled for 35 years from 1154 to 1189, quite a long reign for a medieval king. Uh, he's often described as the first Plantagenet king. Uh, and the reason for that is that his father, Geoffrey Count of Anjou, Anjou is in the Loire Valley in northwestern France. Geoffrey had the nickname Geoffrey Plantagenet. And that's clear, that was, that's recorded at the time. And Plantagenet uh, comes from a plant. In English, it's the broom plant. Uh, in French, it's the plant genet, and in Latin, plantagenista. Uh, it's a flowering shrub. Uh, but why Geoffrey had this nickname, we're not quite sure. Perhaps he wore some, a sprig of the flowers in his hat, or perhaps he liked hunting in the bushes of the broom plant in Anjou. Uh, but in any case, it wasn't the surname, it was his nickname. Uh, and no English medieval king ever called himself Plantagenet. Uh, on the other hand, it's a very convenient tool for historians who need labels. Uh, the same is true of the word Angevin, which is the adjective from Anjou. Uh, and Henry and his sons are sometimes called the Angevin kings. I've done it myself. Uh, and the territories that he ruled, uh, that he and his sons ruled, is sometimes called the Angevin Empire, although historians are a little wary of that since it seems to suggest a, a unity and a, a uniformity that uh, the area that those territories didn't really have. Henry didn't have a smooth path to becoming King of England. He had to fight for it. His claim came through his mother, Matilda, and Matilda was one of the two legitimate children of Henry I of England. And Henry I, although he had more illegitimate children, than any other English king, had only these two legitimate children, William, who was intended as his heir, and Matilda. And by this time, it's not absolutely the uniform rule, but by this time, it's usual that the heir has to be a legitimate child rather than an illegitimate child. So when William, his presumed heir, drowned in a famous wreck, the wreck of the white ship in 1120, uh, a wreck that was probably as famous in the time as the wreck of the Titanic is now. That was a major blow. And Henry I determined that he would actually try to get his daughter to inherit the throne after him, a great rarity. There'd been one case of a ruling queen in Western Europe beforehand, that's all. So it was a rarity, but Henry I was a determined man. He wanted his blood to continue ruling. And he even got his barons to swear an oath that they would accept Matilda. But in 1135, when he died, the barons were perfectly willing to ignore their oath. And Matilda's cousin, Stephen, acted quickly, got himself crowned king, and was accepted by most of the baronage. The 19 years of Stephen's reign was dominated by the struggle between Matilda and her supporters and the king. And as Henry of Anjou, who was the son of Geoffrey Count of Anjou and Matilda, they had married, came to middle teens, his middle teens, uh, he began to be actively involved in this struggle. And eventually he was the one who carried uh, the cause of Matilda to something like success. Matilda herself was never crowned queen, but Henry fought his way uh, to a stalemate in the struggle with Stephen. And Stephen was forced to recognize him as his heir and in 1154, he became king. He had a long reign. It was some very dramatic events in it. Perhaps the most famous is the quarrel he had with Thomas Becket, his, his Archbishop of Canterbury, culminating in the murder of Thomas Becket in Becket's own cathedral, Canterbury Cathedral, a very dramatic event. Uh, Becket was canonized very quickly afterwards as a martyr, uh, and his shrine became one of the most important pilgrimage shrines in Europe. Uh, late in the Middle Ages, uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales are set amongst a group of pilgrims traveling from Southwark in South London to, uh, to Canterbury. And perhaps even more important, though less dramatic in its individual events, uh, it's in Henry's reign that the English colonization of Ireland begins. Uh, a group of, uh, of Henry's nobles went over to Ireland in 1169 to join in the endless wars of the rival Irish kings. And one of them managed to establish his own lordship. Uh, Henry didn't really like that idea, so he went over himself, the first King of England to go to Ireland in 1171, uh, and uh, won the submission of most of the Irish kings and established his royal authority in Dublin, a situation that continued until uh, 1922 and still has a knock-on effect. 
Uh, other issues that one could talk about in relation to his reign, uh, the very central importance of France. He was a, he was a French ruler as much as an English ruler. Uh, the important legal reforms that he undertook, he did make big changes to English law with long-term long -term effects. Uh, and his relationships, his rather tangled relationships with his own family members uh, that uh, actually dominated the last years of his reign. An important thing to remember about Henry II is that although he was King of England, he was French. He was born in France at Le Mans. Uh, he died in France at Chinon. He's buried in France at Fontevrault. And he spoke French. That was his native language. We think it's very unlikely that he spoke English, although he might have understood. He might have understood some English. And during his reign, he spent more time in France than in England. Uh, he spent over 60% of his reign in, in France. So he's a French prince. And in order to understand France at this time, one must bear in mind that although there was a kingdom of France with recognized boundaries, and there was a king of France, uh, the king of France when Henry became king of England was Louis VII, and no one doubts that Louis VII is king of France, the king of France doesn't actually have very much power over most of the territory of the kingdom. He rules a small territory of his own around Paris, but elsewhere, it is the great dukes and counts who actually rule in terms of practical, physical, political power. And Henry II of England had managed to build up a great conglomerate of these duchies and counties. It started when he was very young, when he was in his late teens. Uh, his father, Geoffrey Count of Anjou, married to Matilda, had fought for Matilda's claims against Stephen. And one of the things that he'd done, had, he'd conquered Normandy. Normandy and England obviously had been linked together for, for many years. And Anjou is very close to Normandy, more or less borders it. And Geoffrey had conquered Normandy from Stephen. And in 1150, he gives it to his teenage son, Henry. Uh, a wise move, it gives Henry uh, experience of uh, governing and ruling. Uh, and it means that power is delegated to, to Henry there. So he's, as a young, a, te a young teenager, he is Duke of Normandy. The following year, completely unexpectedly, Geoffrey of Anjou dies. He's only 39. So suddenly Henry, his son, succeeds to the County of Anjou. So he's now Duke of Normandy and Count of Anjou. The very next year, Henry manages to marry one of the great heiresses of France, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Aquitaine is an enormous part of southwest France. It's huge. Its boundaries are a little uncertain. Its nobility is a little bit unruly, but it is a huge chunk of France. And when Henry marries Eleanor of Aquitaine, a famous and well-known figure, uh, he then acquires, in right of his wife, the Duchy of Aquitaine. So he's Duke of Normandy and Count of Anjou and Duke of Aquitaine. The following year, 1153, he comes to the agreement with King Stephen, that means that Stephen will keep the throne until his death, but that Henry will succeed him. And again, a sudden death changes everything. The following year, the very following year, 1154, Stephen dies and Henry becomes King of England. So in the space of four years, 1150 to 54, four or five years, Henry has gone from being the son of a French count to being King of England, Duke of Normandy, Count of Anjou and Duke of Aquitaine. That's an enormous political revolution and it shapes the politics of Northwestern Europe for, for generations to come. It's an enormous change. And from the point of view of the King of France, Louis VII, it's a disaster. And it's compounded by the fact that Eleanor of Aquitaine had previously been married to Louis VII. And at that time, it looked as if suddenly the King of France was gonna really get some real power over the Kingdom of France. And he, he took as his title after he married Eleanor, he took as his title, King of France and Duke of Aquitaine. That's how important Aquitaine was in adding to the territory under his real control. So why did he give her up? Why did he allow the marriage to be dissolved? The problem was that Eleanor, although she'd had children, had only had daughters. And this is a very patriarchal world and kings want to be succeeded by their sons. And there are ways of dissolving marriages. And so Louis VII made the calculation he would give up Aquitaine in the hope of having a son by a, a, a subsequent marriage. 
And so the moment that this marriage is dissolved, Henry of Anjou acts within a very short period of time. He's married Eleanor and acquired Aquitaine. So Louis VII has a kind of personal edge, but there is basically the political situation that the King of France is now hemmed in on every side by this enormous conglomerate of territories owned by someone who is technically his inferior in the kingdom, but actually an independent power. Uh, Paris, which is the center of, of Louis VII's power, is on the River Seine. If you go downstream from the River Seine, there's no, no time at all you come to Normandy. And on the River Seine is Rouen, the, the capital of Normandy, just 70 miles or so from, from Paris. That's blocking any expansion of the French king's real power. And the boundary between the French royal lands and Normandy was a place of constant tension. Another royal centre was Orléans on the River Loire. If you go downstream from, the, uh, downstream from uh, Orléans, downstream on the Loire, you come to Anjou, another blockage. That's also owned by Henry II. So the, the French king is hemmed in territorially by this enormous and new power because it's been created very quickly, Normandy, Anjou, Aquitaine. It's not like there was warfare all the time. There were, there were good relations sometimes. There were even marriage alliances between Henry II's family and Louis VII's family. So it's not constant warfare, but it's a, it's a situation of tension in which one of the goals of the French king has to be to try and reduce this threatening power and to aim for any weaknesses in Henry's position. And one weakness that, uh, that Louis found was actually in Henry's own family. One of the most important aspects of Henry II's reign was the changes that took place in the English legal system. And it's not as if there was a, a major sudden program of change. Um, many of the things that uh, uh, characterized English law under Henry had been seen in the past. It's not as if it was all new. Uh, he was building on foundations going back to Anglo-Saxon law and going back to the law of the, the Norman kings. Uh, but what he seemed to do was to bring a new energy and a new system to dealing with English law. Uh, to take one example, there had been royal justices, royal judges going out into the localities in the past. We know that um, sometimes perhaps based in the county, sometimes sent out to hear a special case. But what Henry did and his advisors was to systematize that so that the whole country was divided up into these circuits where groups of royal judges would travel around from county to county, hearing and determining cases. And so the whole country uh, was covered. That's one of the reasons the law begins to be called, at this time, it begins to be called English common law, because it's common everywhere. And it's common everywhere because there's a bunch of royal judges who, who know each other, some of them are semi uh, really professional judges, uh, and they know what the law is and they apply the same law and it's royal law. So it's an important systematizing centralizing uh, aspect of Henry's legal, legal activities. Uh, when we talk about his uh, legal activities, we use the word assizes sometimes, and it has more than one meaning. One meaning is uh, an enactment or a decree or a set of regulations issued by the king and his counselors. Uh, and in that sense, the important assizes are the Assize of Clarendon of 1166 and the Assize of Northampton of 1176. And these set out aspects of uh, the legal procedure to be followed in various cases, uh, particularly in criminal law. Uh, and it's probably right to say that the changes that Henry made in criminal law are less important than changes he made in other aspects of law, such as uh, property disputes. Um, in the criminal law, the procedure was that there would be juries, local juries, who would say, they would give a list, of who was suspected of serious crimes, such as murder and robbery. Uh, and then the sheriff's duty was to make sure that these characters were <laughs> held securely. Uh, the assizes also specified that there should be jails in every county. So it's a, it's a kind of crime or anti-crime drive. And then when the royal justices came round on their circuits, that's when these people would be uh, actually tried. The jury that gave a list of people was not trying them. It wasn't a trial jury determining guilt or innocence. It was a list of people suspected of crimes. Uh, it's a little bit like the modern American grand jury. And the trial was a time-honored and traditional method 
that was generalized by, by Henry, it had been used a lot before, but he made it uh, the, the only form to be used in these cases, was trial by ordeal. And this is one of the most alien aspects of medieval legal systems uh, in, the, in the eyes of most modern people. Trial by water, which was the common form for trial of criminals in, in Henry's reign, involved the suspect being tied up and then lowered into a pool of water. Uh, the rope on which they were lowered had a knot in it. If they sank to the level that that knot touched the water, that was a proof of innocence. If they floated, if the holy element of water rejected them, they were guilty. And that's something that modern historians have more than one opinion about. Um, if they were guilty, they lost a hand uh, under the assize of Clarendon, under the assize of Northampton, it was a hand and a foot, uh, and they had to leave the kingdom. But even if they passed, even if they were found innocent, if they were still suspected or if they had a bad record, they still had to leave the kingdom. It was a very harsh crime drive, anti-crime drive that Henry initiated. But it did have this element that the, the first step was this jury to say whether people had been suspected. And that was to have a consequence after Henry's reign, because in the reign of Henry's grandson, Henry III, trial by ordeal had been abolished. The church had abolished it and said, you can't use this anymore, this system. And so something had to be found to replace it. So in criminal cases, what came to replace it was the criminal trial jury. And one of the reasons that that was a natural development was that Henry had placed a big emphasis on juries. So it had, as it were, not in his own reign, but in uh, the reign of his grandson, uh, an element in creating the criminal trial jury, which is such an important part of, of English law and, and, and other laws now. The area where he probably made more of a, of a difference was in uh, property disputes, what you might call civil law, civil disputes. This was an agricultural society. Uh, wealth and power fundamentally came from the land. That's where it came from. So who owned land and how much land you had, these were very important uh, questions. And of course, there were endless disputes over them. And what Henry did was he initiated two assizes. And this is the other sense of the word assize. An assize is a legal procedure a form of action at law. And he initiated several new assizes that simplified and, and, and speeded up disputes over land. Uh, and that was done by isolating a, a simple question, an individual question, rather than going into the, the ins and outs of the total rights and, and who, who's got the greater right here. It, it asked a simple question. And the two main examples of, of these assizes, or there are, there are others as well, but the two of them, are, are related to this question of, of who, had the, who had the possession of the land. The term they used was seizing. Who had the rightful possession of this land? And the two most important assizes in that respect, they have French names because of course this was a French speaking world. Uh, one was called Mort d'Ancestor, death of an ancestor. Did this person have rightful possession of the land and is this other person their heir? That's the question. It doesn't go into anything else. And the other important decides is called novel decease in. And novel decease in means recent dispossession. And again, the question is very straightforward. Did this person have rightful possession and were they dispossessed of it recently? And recently was uh, defined and specified. And the way that worked was that the person making the complaint got a royal writ. A writ is a, a short executive order you paid a small amount of money for it, uh, but it was fairly readily available. And that commanded the sheriff to get a jury and ask them this question. Was this person dispossessed? Is this person the, the right idea? These simple questions. And when the justices came round on their circuit, all this would be done. The people would be got together, the writ would be there, the jury would be there, the justices would turn up, and they could get through dozens of these cases in a day. So it was a quick, efficient way of determining that issue. If you wanted to go beyond that to the question of who had the greater right, not the question of who had possession, but right, there was also an assize for that, initiated by the so-called writ of right. And this had slightly more safeguards and was slightly slower, uh, but it was seen very much as an alternative and a, a welcome alternative to the other way of determining property disputes, which had been a very common way of determining property disputes and wasn't completely got rid of, which was trial by battle. 
That is, the claimants would fight it out or their representatives would fight it out, and that would determine the outcome. So trial by jury in the Grand Assize was an, uh, definitely an, an alternative to that. So all this adds up to a series of, of more uniform, swifter, and more royally dominated law. And we see it all crystallized right at the end of Henry's reign in the first technical law book in English law. It's called by the name of Glanville. It was once thought to be by Ranulph de Glanville, Henry's chief justicia. Uh, that's no longer thought, but the book is still called Glanville for convenience. And it sets out the technicalities of these procedures, the assizes and the juries and so on. And if one was to say what was the biggest influence of Henry II on history, I think the formation of this common law would really be the one that most people would point to because trial by jury and the, and the central justices and the circuiting of the country, all this went on uninterrupted right through the following centuries and was taken, of course, to other parts of the world and was eventually taken to North America. This kind of system of law is often called the Anglo-American legal tradition. And we have to look back, certainly, to Henry II's reign to see it in formation. Henry, as a king, faced the situation that all medieval kings faced. That is, his was a dynastic world in which right at the top of the hierarchy, there was a ruling family. And so relations between the ruler and members of his family are politics. There's no distinction. It's not as if there's a private sphere and a, and a public sphere. The, the family politics of the rulers are the high politics of the time. And one of the major issues that these kings were concerned with all the time was the succession. Who would succeed them? And would they have a son to succeed them? Uh, Louis the Seventh had, had dissolved his marriage to Eleanor of Aquitaine because she wouldn't give him a son. Uh, Henry the Second found that she was pretty fruitful with him. Uh, she, she produced, his wife Eleanor produced, um, eight children, uh, seven of whom survived to adulthood, which is a very good record for medieval circumstances when infant mortality was so high. Um, three of them were daughters, uh, and these were married on the international scene. They were married to important royal and great families throughout Europe. This is one of the, the ways that these families kept in touch with each other and influenced each other by sending out their daughters to marry elsewhere. Uh, one of them married the King of Castile, the most important uh, kingdom in, in the Iberian Peninsula. One of them married the kingdom of the King of Sicily. Uh, the kingdom of Sicily included not only the island of Sicily, but the whole of southern Italy at this time. So these were kind of glittering marriages. Uh, and one of them married the Duke of Saxony, who was one of the most important German nobles. Uh, and incidentally, from that marriage, the marriage of the Duke of Saxony to uh, Matilda, the daughter of, of Henry II and Eleanor, in a direct male line, uh, descend the Hanoverian kings of England. George I, George II, and so on. So these were good marriages for the daughters. Then there were the sons. And the dilemma that any medieval king faced was, you wanted a son, but it would probably be safe to have more than one because of the high mortality. This is the problem that had faced Henry I, Henry II's grandfather. He'd only had one legitimate son. And when that legitimate son had drowned, that was the end of the road. Henry had the other problem. He had perhaps too many. Uh, he had four sons who survived to adulthood. One died uh, young. Uh, Henry, who was the oldest and bore his own name. Um, Richard, uh, the second son. Uh, Geoffrey, the third son. And then very much younger than all the rest, uh, nine years younger than Geoffrey, was John, a kind of uh, afterthought. And what was determined in the 1160s was how the conglomerate of territories that Henry had built up should be divided amongst those sons. And because John was not yet born, the plans were originally for the three older sons. And there seems to have been a system or a plan, shall we say, rather than a system, a plan of division that actually made quite good sense and could have worked. Henry, the oldest, was to be given 
paternal inheritance, what had, what had come from uh, Henry II himself, England, Normandy, and Anjou. That, would, that makes sense. And it's a very large amount of territory, uh, and it would satisfy Henry. And in addition, uh, an addition to the plan was that uniquely in medieval England, Henry, the son, was crowned during his father's lifetime. He was crowned in 1170 in a proper coronation. That was a system that you'd find elsewhere. The French kings sometimes did it, the German kings had done it. Having the son crowned during the father's lifetime was a way of kind of guaranteeing uh, the succession because when the king died, there would already be another king, right? There was no uh, openness about it, but it hadn't been done in medieval England. And it's the unique case, in fact, in, in the period uh, of the kings of England. So Henry, he's, Henry the son is actually sometimes called uh, Henry the Third at the time. At the time, uh, more generally, he's known as Henry the Young King. Henry the Young King. So that's what he gets. Richard, the the next one down, he seems to have been the favourite of Eleanor of Aquitaine, and he was going to get Aquitaine. And in fact, he was given authority in Aquitaine. Aquitaine is huge, also very unruly. And Richard, who was going to be, go, go on to be Richard the Lionheart and a famous fighter, um, cut his teeth as a warrior in fighting the nobles of Aquitaine. And the third one, Geoffrey, he couldn't expect anything like that, but arrangements were made for him to marry the heir to the uh, county or duchy, it's known as both, uh, of Brittany. So the Dukes of Normandy had long claimed some kind of overlordship of Brittany, and Henry II was able to enforce that. So he gets Brittany, he's made Duke or Count of the, of the Bretons. That looks as if it's all fine, but the problem is John. He comes in late, he comes in very late. And what's he going to get? It's said, and it's possible, I suppose, Henry II had a sense of humour, that uh, Henry II called him John Lackland, which summed up the problem. And that's really when things start to unravel, because Henry had the reputation, anyway, of regarding John as his favourite, even though he was the, the runt of the litter. And he begins to devise plans for giving John a bit of this and a bit of that, which his... Older brothers are not very keen on at all. I mean, this is a really a, an issue. And in 1173, the whole thing blows up. 1173 to four is the major crisis of Henry's reign. There's a huge rebellion in which the main protagonists are uh, his sons, Henry, uh, Richard, and Geoffrey. Uh, John was still a, a child. And remarkably, his wife, Eleanor. His wife, Eleanor, supports the sons. And the three sons, the three boys, go off to... Louis VII of France. And Louis VII of France is more than happy to welcome them, to see the, his enemy's uh, territories unravelling and this family dispute, more than happy. And an enormous war begins. Henry early on has some successes. Uh, he captures Eleanor of Aquitaine and puts her under house arrest, which was her situation for the rest of, of Henry's lifetime. Uh, he gathers his resources. He's got, he's got his own supporters. He's got his own uh, energy. He was an energetic man. He's reckoned to be uh, one of the more uh, remarkably uh, frenetic of, of England's kings. Uh, you have war right across France and across the British Isles because uh, anyone who's wanting to join in this attack does so. Uh, the King of Scots invades the north of England. Uh, Louis VII invades Normandy. Uh, any rebel baron dissatisfied with Henry's uh, dominant rule in England or in France joins in. So there's, a, there's an enormous 18 month period in which are sometimes called the Great War, a major war rages. And the issue had been sparked off by the question of the succession. Henry eventually has success. He wins several battles. Uh, the, the rebels had rather cleverly uh, tied their case to the, the case of uh, Thomas Beckett who'd been uh, murdered just a few years earlier and had already been canonized as a martyr. And there's actually songs from the period, songs of the rebels, saying the new martyr, that's Thomas Beckett, supports the new young king. So he's being enlisted, as it were, on the side of the rebels. Uh, Henry II very boldly decides to undercut this. He goes to Canterbury, kneels at the tomb of Thomas Beckett, and is actually beaten by the monks as a penance for his supposed part in the murder. And rather remarkably, the following day, uh, the King of Scots is captured in the north of England, by forces loyal to Henry. So obviously Becket had forgiven him. The eventually, uh, Henry 
holds his own to such an extent that the opposition is willing to come to terms. And basically, the idea is that everyone will return to the situation before he forgives his sons. And we are now in the situation where uh, there's peace for a while, for a while. Um, eventually, uh, Henry the Young King is, is still unhappy. Uh, he is willing to uh, join with uh, the King of France again. Uh, he goes into rebellion, uh, but he dies. Uh, he dies in um, 1183. And then you have the situation, he dies in the summer of 1183. And then you have the situation where you have Henry, Ellen are under house arrest, and the three sons, Richard, Geoffrey, and John, slowly growing up. This is the situation depicted rather vividly in the 1968 film, The Lion in Winter, with Peter O'Toole as Henry II, uh, a, a role he'd already played in the film Beckett opposite Richard Burton. Uh, it's uh, Anthony Hopkins' first major role as, as Richard. And it shows very clearly the parts played by those three and the, the, fight, the sons in rivalry, uh, the John as the favorite, uh, and the new French king, Louis VII had been succeeded by Philip Augustus, as he's known, who was uh, rather more determined and rather more militarily capable. And a few years later, 1186, um, Geoffrey dies. So now Henry is left with just two sons, Richard and John. And Richard becomes convinced that his father means to disinherit him and replace him with John. And there is some evidence for that. So it's not as if he's, he's totally paranoid. And this leads to the final crisis of Henry's reign and indeed to, to, his, to his death. Because uh, Richard goes into rebellion. He allies with Philip Augustus, King of France. And he begins a, a, a campaign, a radical, violent campaign uh, across northern France. And he shows his qualities as a soldier, which he, which he was famous for later. Uh, he basically chases his father across northern France. At one point, uh, Richard and, and Philip Augustus, who were in alliance, uh, burn down the, the city of Le Mans, which is Henry's birthplace. And they hunt him down. And eventually, Henry has to submit he agrees to submit to them. Um, one of the terms is that he will forgive all the people who rebelled and joined Richard against him. And to do that, he needs a list. And they give him a list. And the first name on the list is John, his own son, his favourite, who had gone over to Richard, seeing which way the wind was blowing. And he said, I care no more for this world. And he made his way to the castle of Chinon, his favourite, his favourite, one of his favourite castles. And he turned his face to the wall and said, uh, shame shame on a conquered king and died a rather sad perhaps rather pathetic end to a reign that had been very long very formative and had cast i think uh, a long shadow over the future it really shaped uh, both french and english politics uh, english law uh, relations within the british isles it was a it was a formative and important period and it ends with a dramatic and rather tragic turn. Hello guys, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoy our work and would like to support the channel, please visit our revamped Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee membership pages, which contain rewards such as early access to our content, merchandise discounts, and audio versions of our videos, along with much more that we give to our valued supporters. If you have not yet signed up to help our cause, we'd like to ask you to please consider doing so, as we need to secure the channel by safeguarding it from possible demonetization, but also invest in better equipment, software, and more people to help us improve our videos going forward. In short, without your contributions, these videos would not be possible. So if you would like to ensure this channel never has to shut down due to demonetization, please spare whatever you can per month and become People Profiles patrons. Thanks for listening.